Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Um, this is the last lecture of the biomarkers module that I personally will be teaching. Uh, today we're going to talk about machine learning, a topic that is tremendously important across all of bioinformatics, but it has certainly played a really major role in the space of clinical biomarkers. Now we still have class on Thursday. On Thursday, Dr. Reeve will be back here to lead a journal club. Over the weekend, you should have received a paper uh, from me by email. Did that arrive? Oh, good. I'm glad that the, uh, the student number system worked on this case. So uh, that, that paper you should definitely read in advance of Thursday. Um, and he will try to untangle some of the more complicated pieces of that paper uh, with you on Thursday. So that will be the last class of the clinical biomarkers course. And then next Thursday, nine days from now, we'll meet back in this room at 9 o'clock where I will administer an assessment. I will hand out a test paper with 20 multiple choice questions drawn from all seven sessions. Yes, the Journal Club is also part of the assessment. And uh, you will fill in your, your answers to those questions. That will determine in total your grade from the clinical biomarkers module. Okay? I think you've had some chance to see what my questions look like in the past. Um, that's probably a pretty good anticipation of what this uh, assessment will also look like. All right, so today we're going to talk about the, the fine art of using machine learning or statistical learning in the context of clinical biomarker data sets. Um, we, uh, we find that machine learning has become so widely used in bioinformatics today that in some, uh, in, in some of the groups of which I'm part, we've developed a, a drinking rule that if somebody says machine learning is your job, to take a drink. So it's, it's, a, it's not just a uh, what's hot in bioinformatics, it's also a drinking game. All right, so uh, let us talk then about what we attempt to do by creating a, uh, by using supervised machine learning. What do we mean by supervised machine learning? And I definitely want you to have some understanding of how training, validation, and testing sets differ from each other, what their purposes are. There are um, some serious challenges that can arise from the use of machine learning. Today we'll talk specifically about overfitting, which is a very common problem in machine learning, and signal leakage, which is a, a really important challenge that can get in the way of our using machine learning properly. And finally, we're going to get down to some of the modes in which machine learning gets applied. We'll be talking about decision trees, which I think everybody can get their heads wrapped around very quickly and thus understand their relationship to random forests, random forests. From there, we'll talk about artificial neural networks, which have been used for uh, an approach called uh, deep learning. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about a much more statistical approach called support vector machines, or SVMs. All of these get used all the time throughout bioinformatics, not just in the context of clinical biomarkers. But uh, we'll try to untangle uh, how these elements work so that everybody can understand better when, at least when you read a paper that says we use machine learning, you can ask yourself difficult questions about the research. Did, uh, did the approach they used uh, uh, subject them to a greater risk of overfitting? Uh, did, they, uh, did they express uh, the, the quality of their supervised learner in a way that's fair or have they overrepresented what, they are, what machine learning accomplished for them? Very common problems in, in biological manuscripts. Okay, so um, let us start then with supervised and unsupervised learning. I, I borrowed this definition from James Lee. Um, I, I'm going to spend most of today's lecture on this topic of supervised learning, but we will have at least one slide to talk about the unsupervised case. So let us imagine then that I have my data set, uh, and for it, I have labels. That, that's a rather generic kind of term, but let, let's imagine that for the 800 people participating in this study, I happen to know that these 600 uh, are all controls. They're all nominally healthy, and these 200, uh, the, these 200 samples all came from people with TB, right? So in this case, we have a label. We have healthy or, and TB uh, in, that, in, in that design. You might have multiple groups like uh, TB, other lung diseases and healthy, nominally healthy people. Um, but these are all cases where we don't just have the data from these samples, we also have a label to go with it. 
And that label will sometimes go under the name a gold standard or a ground truth. You'll, you'll hear all of those terms used. This is to say that we, we know um, factually, in reality, does this person have this disease or not? Okay, so in a case like that, um, we want to be able to use the information from this training set to learn rules by which we can deduce the label for somebody for which we don't have that label. So we've, uh, we've run RNA-seq on whole bloods from all of these folks in the training set. We knew their labels. We deduced which transcripts were most associated with TB status, and we could then uh, uh, use that on RNA-seq data sets derived from people for whom we don't know the labels. That's an example of supervised learning to create a predictor. Okay, so that's very powerful. But unsupervised learning also has a really important role in understanding biomarker studies. Let's imagine that it's much, much earlier in time, maybe the 1970s, and we're working with data that we've produced from breast cancer patients. Now, it might be that we tried to compare uh, uh, people with breast cancer to people who don't have breast cancer and uh, tried to uh, discern what biomarkers help us separate people into sick and not sick in that case. Now, that would all be fine and good if breast cancer were one phenomenon, but in fact, breast cancer is a really complex disease and there are very significantly different subtypes within breast cancer that can present quite differently in phenotype and they certainly must be treated very differently in terms of what medicines are available to them. So, uh, in a case like that, we might want to do uh, a bit of learning from our data, but in this case, we're not trying to create a predictor. We're trying to understand the relationships of the people within these data sets. So, rather than treat all the people with breast cancer as they have breast cancer and these do not, and that's all we label the, the two cohorts, we might instead say, which of the people with breast cancer are most similar in, in disease? Are there individuals in the not cancer set that look a lot like people who do have cancer on the basis of these, these measurements? So in a case like that, you're actually exploring your data. Unsupervised learning is useful when you want to discover the implicit relationships within these data sets. So rather than start by saying, this is cohort A and this is cohort B, you can start by saying which of, these, which of these patients are most similar to each other on the things we measure. So that's very powerful. Now, what can that look like? So I'm only going to have just the one slide now on unsupervised learning, but it's an important capability to, to know about. So we're going to talk a little bit about clustering and PCA. Have, have, has anyone heard of PCA from an advisor saying you need to do PCA on that? Okay, what's well, going to show up? Because in grad school, everybody ends up getting to do PCA at some point. You're, you're messing around in GraphPad Prism, and, and your advisor says, okay, show me the PCA of that. So we'll, we'll learn what that is today. So let's start first with clustering. Clustering. So uh, before, I mentioned the, the case where you might have a breast cancer cohort, but you believe that certain patients within the breast cancer cohort are much more similar to each other than they are to others also within the breast cancer cohort. So one of the things that we can do is to create what we, what, we, what we would call a distance metric, a distance metric. So if you have uh, 20 measurements from each person in your breast cancer cohort, you would like to be able to say uh, which two patients show the strongest relationship on, on the basis of the metrics we computed. So we said we were doing 20 different measurements for them. One of the things that you could do is called a Euclidean distance. Have you heard of a Euclidean distance? No? Okay, well that's fine. So um, I think we all remember what right triangles are, correct? Right, they're, right, they're triangles that have a right angle in them, a 90 degree angle. So if you know that metric, on metric one, this patient is a 0.8, and the other person is a 1.0, and that on the other metric, this person is a 0.6 and the other one is a 0.8, you can compute the distance between them by creating a point in that 2D space where patient one is and another point where patient two is based on these metrics. And then you can compute the distance between those two points. And we do that with the Pythagorean theorem. You know, remember the a squared plus b squared equals c squared? It's the same thing when we're trying to compute the distance between two people in this metric space. 
Now, if you've measured 20 different metrics for each patient, you don't have a 2D space, you have a 20-dimensional space. But the good news is the math is exactly the same. So, you can compute a distance between patients in the space of the metrics that you've computed from them. Those metrics can then be used as a proxy for relatedness. That's a, that's a bit of a conceptual leap, but not a huge one. What we're arguing is that people who have similar diseases or similar genetic responses to disease or whatever have similarity in the measurements we make from them. Maybe those are uh, cell counts, maybe those are transcripts, maybe those are protein, uh, proteins that we've measured. It doesn't matter too much. We make the assertion that people with similar disease will have similar metrics that we're measuring. From those metrics, we can compute distances. People who are close together are likely to have more similar phenotypes. People who are far apart are more likely to have very different phenotypes. Good so far? A few more nods. A couple squints. That happens. Well, if, if I'm running right past you, stop me. You know this, right? I'll stop and talk about it more. All right, so we now have this space in which we can say which people are most similar. From that, those distances, we want to create a dendrogram. <clears throat> the dendrogram means a, a finger diagram. I've shown one here at the bottom left of the slides. So you can imagine that uh, with these individuals in space, let's say we have 10 people in our, in our cohort. We can ask how far is person one from person two? How far is person one from person three? How far person one is from person four, person one from person five, etc. You see all these different pairwise distances we can compute? Everyone sees that? Does everyone remember how to com compute how many different distances there are in a set of 10 people? This is the cocktail party problem or the handshake problem. How many different handshakes can you have with 10 people in a room? We've got roughly that number, so we could do the experiment right now. But I'll tell you that the answer is n, 10 in this case, times n minus 1, 9 in this case, divided by 2. So 10 times 9 is 90, thank you. Divide by 2 and you get 45. So there are 45 distances that you can compute from 10 people in the study. You can then build a dendrogram that groups together people who are closest together in that space. And that clustering helps you to understand from the data you've collected which people are phenotypically the most similar. And it's a way to learn that from your data, not to just impose a label on it and say, well, these folks all have breast cancer and these all don't. You see where I'm going? Along the way, you can frequently do things like notice problems in your annotation. What if one of the people that you marked as doesn't have cancer really does have cancer? You won't be able to discover that with a super supervised system because you're relying on the all-important label. But in a case like this, you might detect a, a, a person you would otherwise have mislabeled. Okay, now principal component analysis is quite a different, uh, a different fish. I'm showing a little diagram here of, uh, of a 2D principal component analysis, uh, uh, sometimes called a biplot in this case. You've collected a lot of data about a lot of people, right? Maybe you've collected a thousand different gene expression measurements. Maybe you've looked for genetic mutations in a set of 700 genes. Maybe you've done ELISAs uh, for a huge number of proteins that we, can, that we have commercial assays for. That's all great, but you're already aware that some of the measurements you've made for different genes look really similar. Like it might be that whenever this gene is up, this one is also up, and whenever this gene is down, this gene is down. These two genes, their expression values, are not independent. So treating them as independent is not really safe. So one of the things that we can do is to recognize which of our metrics go up and down together all the time, and thus have very little separate value, but have a lot of value together. So in something like this, principal components analysis will recognize correlations between the, the metrics that we've computed and be able to use that to, uh, to basically treat those as one component rather than as multiple components. The, the value is that the components you get back are going to be sorted 
by how much of all of the variants they explain. So maybe you fed it a hundred or a thousand gene expression values, and it gave you back the same number of, uh, the same number of components, but you know that most, the, the, the most variance you can explain from the data set is component one. The second most variance you can explain from the data set is component two. And this time, they're not correlated. It may be that even though you fed the software uh, expression values for a thousand genes, you can explain almost all of the variants with five or six components. Isn't that powerful? So this approach is sometimes called a projection pursuit allows you to change from a whole set of metrics that you fed into the approach and get back a relatively small number of components. And in a PCA plot like this, we're generally just looking at principal component one versus principal component two. You would be surprised how much of the variation in your overall data set can be accounted for by just one or two components based on PCA. So both of these methods are very good for exploring what the data have to tell you and allow you to gut check, to, uh, to test whether the labels you're going to apply to these data sets really are different enough. Okay, so clustering and PCA, very good methods to know about for all kinds of data sets, not just biomarkers. All right, <clears throat> now uh, let's talk about supervised learning. This is really the topic of the rest of the lecture. So um, this is, I think, a really good high-level place to start. Let's have our, our little conversation with the computer, right? Mr. Computer, I have measured these features for all of my subjects, okay? So I now hand it a table. Mr. Computer has now received a data table that has patient one, patient two, patient three, and then measure, 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 and probably some labels as well. Got that? All right. Now, to the computer, I, th those labels are going to receive some significance. This subset of subjects represents the positives. That subset, subset of subjects represents the negatives. So I'm, I'm now using the, the, specifying the label information that's going to separate one cohort from the other. I then say to the supervised learner, find a strategy to combine information across all these features that I've measured. These are the, the metrics that I've computed, for, or that I've uh, recorded for each member of my study. And I'm, I want it to tell me which features are best for separating the positives from the negatives. So I don't know, right? I, I just measured a thousand genes. I, I figured one of these or some of these are going to be good for telling the people with breast cancer from those who don't, uh, who, who don't have the disease, right? I mean, that, that's, that's the whole point of the biomarker discovery process. I have a bunch of measurements. I'm not sure which of them. Are, are able to bear the load of discerning people who are sick from people who aren't. So the software is asked to find uh, a set of these markers that we can use for separating. So uh, there are multiple goals that we're going for all at the same time. Quite frequently in biomarker studies, you will find that these questions have become very commingled in the minds of the people who set up these studies. That is a dangerous thing because there are a lot of ways that creating a supervised learner can really go wrong. And a lot of people, especially biologists who don't understand the insides of the box for machine learning, can run afoul of having all these different purposes going on at the same time. So let's imagine, identify a small set of features that yield the best possible classifier. Okay, so I, I just said that I probably measured a whole bunch of genes in my survey. Maybe I've measured a thousand or even ten thousand genes and asked how much expression do I see for each of them. My thought was a few of these are very informative. Now what if I were to look at gene by gene? Let's, let's say that we don't know what supervised learning is. So we've, we've got our positives and our negatives and we just go through our spreadsheet and we say which of these genes is best at separating this cohort from that cohort. We could do that, right? I mean, if we're doing this in Excel, we probably just t-test the heck out of it, right? So we run a t-test for gene one, cohort versus cohort. T-test for gene two, cohort versus cohort. T-test for gene three, we could do this. You could just paste in these formulas in Excel and it'll very cheerfully do, you know, 10,000 p-values for you. You could do that. 
So you then might say, all right, if I want to find the smallest set of genes for which the expression is a good biomarker, I'm going to grab out the five genes that have the lowest p-value in my Excel spreadsheet. That worked, right? However, I just talked to you about the, the principal components analysis relying on the fact that there's a lot of correlation among these metrics that we fed Excel. What if you took the five genes that had the lowest p-values in your Excel spreadsheet and said, that's my biomarker? It could be that those five genes are all part of the same pathway, and thus they're all upregulated or downregulated together. In that case, you've picked five genes, but you've only picked one pathway for evaluating whether this, this person is a positive or a negative. Question, yes? So would that then be the difference between alpha and class Ah, um, well, a component doesn't know about class labels at all. So when you run PCA on your data set, it has no use for what, what cohort does this person come from. So it doesn't know if this person has breast cancer or not. It's just got the measurements you've made on the people and tries to put, it, put together its best assessment of variance in that data set, not on the basis of cohort classification. So um, is, it, is it based on like, a, so I saw in the other slide you say that Feature, do features make up like a component? So features that are related make up Right, yes. The, the components that are returned by PCA mm -hmm. represent a, a linear combination of the metrics that you fed it. So if you had 20 things you were measuring about each person, you could imagine a, a, a letter corresponding to the weight for each of those. So maybe the weight on feature number one is A, the weight on feature number two is B, the weight on feature number three is C. So you can just say, uh, that PCA is going to compute some values for A through whatever the 20th letter is. S? No idea. All right, so it, it's going to put together a, a set of weights, and then the, the new position for this data point is going to be the weighted combination of the 20 metrics to put it into principal components space. So yeah, it, it receives metrics and it kicks out components. But the components are some weighted uh, relationship of the, the metrics. But PCA doesn't know or care what the, the labels are. In, in the case of a supervised learner, uh, in this case of a supervised learner, we are providing those labels and asking which of these features is best to separate people on class, on, on label. And the, uh, an unsupervised method would not receive those labels at all. Is that a good answer? Okay, great. Okay. And keep the questions coming, because I know that this topic is a rather bewildering one. Okay, so if you were just trying to say which set of genes are most useful in differentiating one group from the other, you could just go after this by t-testing to, to your heart's content and picking the low values. But there's very little guarantee that the genes that come out are going to be... Uh, it, it, there's quite a lot of likelihood that some of the, the genes that come off of that list are going to be really correlated with each other. And so using just the five lowest p-values isn't going to help you very much. You're not going to get added value out of using the second or third or fourth or fifth gene if all of those are correlated with each other. Okay, so that's one possible thing you could try to do, to say which, what's a very small set of these genes that are useful for discerning classes. Next, you could use the classifier to understand the underlying biology. Okay, so somebody publishes a signature that allows them to um, detect people who are within six weeks of developing tuberculosis. That's great, right? Wouldn't that be great? We just run around, um, you know, neighborhoods where there are a lot of, there's, where TB is running rampant. We just test everybody, and people who have a really high score on this thing, well, we throw them in a hospital right away. It'd be wonderful. Okay, but what if? Uh, what if instead of thinking about the clinical utility of this biomarker panel, someone is instead trying to learn how, late, uh, how the late stages of, of health as someone develops tuberculosis is changing? What if we're trying to understand the molecular events that lead to progression to tuberculosis active disease? Right, that's different. So one of these is the question that a clinician would ask. Which of these people do we need to put in treatment right away? The other of these is a biological question. 
what are the what are the late stage events as someone develops tuberculosis, as the body begins losing its fight against this bug, right? Okay, so that is a rather different kind of question. And of course, the most accurate classifier is, is, is this, this third way we might go. Um, remember that we talked about sensitivity and specificity. I'm sure you all deeply embedded that, that definition down deep in your hearts, because it's almost assuredly on the assessment. So accuracy is kind of a third way to look at this, to say what fraction of all the people who were, we tested are we able to put a correct label on, sick, not sick. Okay, so this is much more in line with the clinical uh, uh, application of a biomarker. The biologist and the, the molecular person who's, who's trying to pick, pick out a set of genes that they want a graduate student to follow up, and the clinician all have rather different takes on what these clinical biomarker uh, predictive classifiers mean. Okay, so uh, we are now going to talk about me. It's my class, right? I get this privilege. My family has a, a special holiday associated with Easter. So every April, when, when Easter comes around, my family uh, celebrates Easter dutifully, right? I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a happy holiday. But for us, the real holiday comes afterward. My family goes to the discount store, and as a group, we each try to find the cheapest bag of jelly beans. Jelly beans are very much an Easter candy for the United States. And there, there's a badge of honor in, in our family for the person who finds a, a whole bag of jelly beans on deep discount for 10 cents, right? I mean, that's a, that's a great deal if you can find it. So naturally, my family gains weight in the post-Easter months as we dig through these great mounds of, of jelly beans that we've hoarded for the rest of the year. Um, and correspondingly, my family has a strong penchant for diabetes. So uh, let us now look at uh, patient ID DLT001. I'm going to I'm going to identify this data set and say this is me. Okay. So uh, I want our our feature vector here uh, is is going to be the set of things we measured about this particular patient. So DLT01 has a temperature of 37 degrees C. Good or bad? You all right with that one? Yeah. That's pretty ordinary. I have a BP. What's this? Blood pressure, 120 over 80 millimeter, uh, an HbA1c. Anyone he heard of that? Ah, so diabetes runs in a few families. All right, so HbA1c is the hemoglobin A1c value. Uh, it's very valuable uh, to know about, uh, goodness, is this about the glycation of hemoglobin mo molecules? Basically, having a bunch of sugar running around in your blood is not a great thing. Uh, the BMI. But, okay, yes, I got married recently, so my belly is swelling, body mass index is rising quickly, and I have a blood glucose level here, so uh, I have 5.3 millimolar per liter. These are measurements that we've now made. So, can we use this information, imagine if we had this for 50 people or 1,000 people, could we use this information to deduce which of the people had metabolic syndrome or diabetes itself, right? That will be very valuable. So each column is representing a different feature. These features are all measurements off of that particular sample ID. We can call all of this a feature vector. A feature vector. Does everyone remember vector from Algebra 2 and linear algebra, stuff like that? And people loved math class here, didn't they? Wow. Well, it's all right. A vector is just a bunch of numbers in a you know, 1D array here. So this. This individual patient could be viewed on each of these as a different axis. So imagine that we have temperature, right? So let's say that we bin people. Everyone between 37.0 and 37.1 goes in this bin. Everyone between 37.1 and 37.2 degrees goes in this bin and so on. So we have this axis and each person fits somewhere along that axis. We have blood pressure. Uh, we'll call that two different metrics, right? We'll have the systolic and diastolic, uh, diastolic uh, measurements. So we'll treat each of those as two, uh, two coordinates. And we can place people in relationship to where they are on systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So this vector represents a location in space. In this case, one, two, three, four, five, six dimensions. And you could put me in this 
feature space in one, at one location. So that vector essentially represents an, an arrow pointing to where Dave is in this six-dimensional space. It's fine. Okay, so features taken together are vectors. Different features are going to take on different types. They may be integers, they may be floating point numbers. Here we have, for example, 26.2. We don't want to throw away the point two information because that could be valuable. Um, and they may be values drawn from a set, right? We might have, for example, a sex column and put me uh, down as a male, for example. That's a value drawn from a set. When we have very big, ugly clinical data sets, it's quite likely that some of the values we want would be missing. I'm sorry, I was really sick over the last four days, so my throat is barely hanging on here. Okay, so this sounds like a relatively easy kind of problem, and it might seem that, of course, yes, throw enough compute power at this, you're gonna get answers out that you really like. But the reality is that this is statistically a very badly behaved problem due to the curse of high dimensionality. This shows up a lot. So, as the number of features grows, as the number of things we measure about each person grows, the more observations we need in order to figure out how to weigh all those different features. So you might think that you did yourself a really big favor by measuring all the transcripts. You know, maybe you have 100,000 transcripts that you measured for each person. That might seem great, but the more things you measure about people, the more observations you need, the more people need to be in your study. So this is something that we haven't really got a way to just circumvent. And we see lots of cases where um, people are measuring all the transcriptome and don't really know how to correctly power their studies. They can't get enough clinical samples to find um, a, a really robust biomarker from it. So generally speaking, Today, biomarker feature sets typically will outnumber the number of people in the study by 10 or even a thousand fold. This is a recipe for the problem of overfitting, uh, one that we'll be talking about as we move ahead. So the, the result of overfitting is that given some training set, you can come up with some biomarker panel that will, that will almost perfectly separate all the healthies from all the not healthies. But that biomarker is useless. Because the minute you try to apply that biomarker in a new cohort of people, a completely different data collection, you find that that biomarker falls flat on its face. That what looked like a perfect biomarker in the training set is of zero value. It fails to generalize because it is just peculiar to the nature of the training set. Anytime you have far more features than you have patients in your study, the, this problem of overfitting is quite likely to come out of it. So one of the things that we can attempt to do is to use feature selection, to use some sort of process from the word go that cuts down this huge space of all the different things we could teach us to differentiate the cohorts and instead give us a reduced set of features we're going to work from. So you could score each feature alone and then only use the ones that are the best to feed that in as, as this is a marker that you, this is a metric that we can use uh, in our supervised learning. And you can add or remove features iteratively. You can say, uh, what if I use a minimum information criterion, for example, to say any, any transcript that I'm going to include in my supervised learner must be observed in at least 50% of the people in my study. You could do something like that that will cut out a tremendous number of, of transcripts and leave you with a much smaller number uh, to be used in the process of supervised learning. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, let us now imagine that it is time for us to proceed forward with our predictive, our predictive model. We start with all the measurements from all the samples. We've applied some sort of rule, perhaps, to cut out some of the genes that had the spottiest measurements, for example. Uh, we're now going to subdivide those samples into a training set, a validation set, and a test set. Generally speaking, data that go into the test set are held sacrosanct until the very, very end. So maybe you've pulled aside, say, 10% of all of the measurements you had in the original study, and you've separated those off to be a test set. 
uh, that data set must not be used until you have a finished classifier you're ready to characterize. That's the whole value of the test set. It is, it is a set to which your learner is naive. It's, it, those data have never been observed in the process of creating your biomarker uh, predictive, uh, predict, predictive model. Okay, so we now have a training set uh, that consists of labels and that has uh, these, these feature vectors for each of the people that represent each of the values measured for the, the biomarkers to be considered. We're going to get two things out of this. One will be a putative biomarker set. So we, we started with a huge number of features uh, in, in each vector. And in this case, our, 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 when we trained our model, it came up with a, set, a much more limited set of measurements that it's going to use as part of its deciding whether someone is sick or not. So maybe you, me maybe you measured all the transcriptome, you applied some sort of minimal information criterion to cut that down to, say, 10,000 transcripts. Then, in training a, a predictive rule, the software said, well, I don't need all 10,000 of these using just this dozen, just this dozen metrics, I can decide whether someone is sick or not. So that's a really big cut down, right? You've done something to knock out the, the, the features that weren't, of, uh, that weren't consistently enough measured to begin with, but now machine learning has said, this set of, of genes that we've measured is, is all I need to decide whether someone fits in this class or that class. So that's a, a very small uh, set of markers and it has some sort of decision rule applied to it. Maybe it's a, a logistic function, for example. So given the values of these 10 gene measurements or 12 gene measurements, the software has some way to combine those values together that goes to a 1 if the person is sick or a 0 if the person is not. And somewhere on there, it's, it's going to say, well, if the value is greater than 0.5, we call them a positive. If it's less than 0.5, we call them a negative. So that's quite a lot to do. The training set is a pile of data, right? Now, the software needs to characterize whether that rule is worth anything. So it will turn to the validation set to make that discrimination. So the model is created by looking at the training set, and then it is evaluated, it's validated through the validation set. And from that, we're going to see something like an ROC plot to say what we knew in the validation set that these people had TB and these people didn't, or these people had breast cancer and these people didn't. And then the software produces an ROC curve, which we talked about last time, to evaluate whether or not somebody, uh, the, the people who did have disease were classified as having disease, and the people who didn't have disease were classified as not having disease. This curve is going to represent that success then. The software Learn, uh, learned how to, how to make its rules based on the training set, and then it evaluated whether that rule was worth anything using the validation set. Very frequently, uh, we will find there are many, many generations of, of attempts to create models in this space. One thing that we frequently see people doing is using uh, tools like, say, SuperLearner or something like that to, uh, to create an artificial neural network uh, based uh, decision rule, uh, to create an SVM based rule, to create any number of other uh, a random forest model for deciding which folks uh, had, had this illness and which didn't. And each of these different approaches will get used against the validation set to see which of these approaches results in the best AUC curve. Now that's all great, but you see that there's a lot of gaming that can be done here. The person might say, uh, all right, well, for the first go, I gave it all of the data, and I produced uh, the best model I could, I, I could do under, uh, say, random forests. But then they say, well, I bet this would be a lot cleaner if I had told the software, only pay attention to these genes for which we had solid measurements. So now they've refiltered their data, thrown it back through the learner, and now they've got a different model that came back from random forests. You can see there's a, a world of tinkering that you can do in order to get to this stage. So it's only when you have the model that you're going to go forward with at the very end that you should apply to the test set. And in all this tinkering, you know, that you've probably had, had some uh, 
some concern about whether the validation set was really representative of the data to give you a decent uh, evaluation or not. There's been all sorts of fighting that goes on. But then only once, as you go to put together your paper, do you test in the test set. And that gives you a tested model, and that is an okay AUC value to report. You will very frequently see that people don't like how their work, how their uh, decision model um, performed when it gets to the test set. And a lot of people will think it's okay that, well, I had a great AUC value here, but I had a terrible one here, so I'll publish this one. Those people are cheating. That is wrong. And it is a, a great way for somebody who knows about machine learning to write on your paper, do not accept under any circumstances this person is gaming the numbers to make their research look good. And I will tell you, there are a lot of people in biomarker research who are very interested in showing their model is great and will choose these numbers because it makes their software look great. That is cheating, and it is a very, very bad practice. It's one of the reasons why biomarker research has uh, frequently looked like a bunch of cheating nonsense. Okay, now, there are some alternative strategies to how we partition to training and validation sets. If we flip back one slide, I, I made it seem that the training set is one set of the data, the validation set is a separate one, and the test set is yet another. The test set is going to be held aside in, in a very literal sense. It is not going to be shown to the models until the very last stage when we go to press. But there are some ways that people change how the test, uh, the test and validation sets, uh, sorry, how, the, uh, how the, the training and validation sets differ from each other. So we had all of these data to begin with. We set aside these for use in the final test, and they will not participate until the very last stage. But this training set will sometimes get split into different validation sets. You see that in this case, the validation, uh, the, the train set has been split to five different 20%. So the last 20% serve as the validation model for this first uh, training set. The next to last, the penultimate 20%, serves as the validation set in this case. The middle 20% serves as the validation model here, and so on. So you can see that one five-way split of the training set gives us five different models that can all be tested against different validation sets drawn from within this larger uh, training set. So this is called a cross-validation, and in this case, a five-fold cross-validation. There's also a kind of a, a silly cousin called leave one out cross, uh, leave one out cross validation, uh, uh, L O O L O O C. Um, so these are these are different methods in which we can generate multiple models to evaluate how stable the models are. So let's think about how that would work. If I have my learner create a different rule for this four fifths of the data, this four fifths of the data, this four fifths of the data, and so on and I'm keeping everything constant. They're all getting the same inputs. We're just changing which ones are part of validation and which ones are part of training. We're gonna get five different models out. And if we're using exactly the same methods, we should expect that there's a pretty high degree of correspondence among these models. You're gonna have a really big problem if you find that the decision rule that you create in these three is really good, and the decision rule that comes out of this is trash. That would be a really bad, uh, a really bad outcome, and would suggest that the, the teaching and uh, the, sorry, that the training and validation strategy you've chosen is is not giving you very uniform results. That would be called sampling error in another uh, another light. Okay. Now we're drawing into uh, the the more technical part of the lecture where we talk about the the methods here. I, I realize that it's very difficult to get your head wrapped around machine learning in one go, so I appreciate you sticking with me on this one. I'm going to try to give you some very basic rules that can help you know whether what you're reading is technobabble or something worthwhile. Um, generally speaking, you're going to find equal bits of both as you read the literature in this field. Do not assume that because someone is using machine learning that they're using it correctly. That is a very unsafe assumption at this stage. So, uh, let's start with, thou shalt not represent thy model's performance using the validation set. You remember just a couple slides ago, I pointed out that 
people who don't like how their test set uh, performed in their in their uh, their predictive model will sometimes represent the, the 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 ROC curves that were produced back here. That's really really unsafe, and it suggests frankly, unsavory intent, that people are trying to deceive you with how good their, their biomarker is. So you must use the test set, a test set that is used only once for testing the, the quality of the model uh, at this stage, uh, the first stage. Number two, thou shalt not overfit thy model. If you have 100 people in your study and you measure 10,000 genes for each of them, there is probably a pair of genes in there that can be used to perfectly separate all of the positives from all of the negatives. That's the nature of, this, uh, of, of the problem of, of making huge numbers of measurements off of relatively small numbers of people. So we have to be careful not to overfit our models. We must always be able to show that the decision rule, the, 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 the biomarker panel that we've derived from one data set is applicable in another data set. Um, that's, what the, that's the function of the test set. So we need to be on guard that when we allow the software to see the measurements of 10,000 genes, we're giving it enough people that it's an adequate test of whether separation is really happening in this uh, decision rule. Thou shalt not generalize outside thy scope. Oh, I suffer from this one a lot. I, I work with people who uh, have made tuberculosis biomarker rules, right? So they. They feel they have systems that capture some of the earliest events in, in TB infection, uh, but then they, they step outside of what that intended clinical purpose was for that biomarker. They can say, for example, uh, this model is good for us to say which household contacts of TB patients are most likely to get sick. That's what they did the study in, right? But then they say, this same set of five, uh, of five genes is equally useful for tracking which people are responding well to TB treatment. Do you see why those are different questions? Very different questions. And then they can say, well, we applied this uh, biomarker in the context of people who uh, are coming to the clinic uh, with a cough to decide which of them have TB. You can see this is feature creep, right? I mean, the, we have... We, we start by saying it's a dessert topping and then we say it's a floor wax. That's not really okay. We need, we need to be clear in defining how this, uh, how this biomarker was created, what its purpose is, and then stop talking about it as though it serves all purposes in TB. That is not safe. Thou shalt scrub thy input of signal leakage. This term is not as clear to people. I haven't defined this one yet, but we're going to hit it in, I think, uh, the slide after next. Uh, and I, I, I want to be clear why it's important. Thou shalt expect model instability. Now, just a slide ago, I was showing you five-fold cross-validation, a case where you develop the same model five times, just changing which, uh, which samples are part of the training set and which ones are part of the validation set. You should expect that the model is going to fluctuate, that which genes it finds are important is going to change each time. Finally, Thou shalt not use machine learning uncritically. Do not assume that because someone used machine learning, they've got a better biomarker. Generally speaking, machine learning is a bear trap with lots and lots of nasty teeth. So there are lots of ways to foul up your result by using machine learning. And you should always be skeptical of seeing that your model with machine learning versus your model without machine learning is somehow uh, goes from, you know, from, from being uh, terrible to brilliant, that's a matter of some concern. It may be that machine learning is fooling you into believing uh, that your result is better than it is. Okay, so let's start with this overfitting problem. I, uh, I asked a mattress designer uh, to take a photograph of me and how I slept last night and then make, a, make the perfect bed for me, right? So that having taken a photograph of how I sleep at night, I have this mattress made for me. That's brilliant, right? What's problematic about this bed design? <laughs> What's that? Gonna I'm going to fall, exactly, exactly. So the snapshot upon which this mattress was based does not capture the variability in how David Tab sleeps at night. Because I might start out on my side curled over like that, and that's when the snapshot was taken. 
But then what about in the middle of the night where I'm like, <laughs> right? It's not going to work very well for that. So we, we have this problem then that if we create a model that is fit to this particular snapshot, it doesn't represent all the variability in the real phenomenon. Okay? So overfitting creates a model that may look great, but in fact perform very poorly. Uh, and of course I'm joking. This is uh, taken from an artist's portfolio, I, but it's such a great example of overfitting I had to uh, include it. Okay, now uh, I want you to imagine that once again we're trying to decide does Dr. Tab have diabetes, right? Now before we had my temperature, my blood pressure, my HbA1c, my BMI, and my blood glucose, but look we've added something new. We've added a new column down here. It says insulin units per day. Insulin units per day. And this one is marked as 40 units. Okay, now, does that column say, does Dr. Tab have diabetes or not? It doesn't. It, this is not a, a true false, this is not a yes or no. So we might think that it's safe for our predictive model to get that information. But if I include this information in the training data, I'm going to have a really big problem in my predictor because the predictor is going to recognize that the only people with positive values in insulin per day are people with diabetes. People who have zero here, most of them have no diabetes, right? So this is, this is a really big problem. This is what we call signal leakage, that we have information we're providing to our, uh, to our model and training that is perfectly predictive of the classes and, and thus gets over relied upon in making that measurement. Obviously, if you're trying to determine undiagnosed people with diabetes, checking to see whether they're already taking insulin a day is not that useful because people who don't have diabetes who are taking insulin are pretty rare on the ground. Okay, so this is an example of signal leakage, including information like that will really distort the result that comes out of machine learning. All right, now we are going to talk about the methods by which machine learning takes place. Let me check how my time is doing here. Oh yeah, I gave myself four minutes to go through these slides. That's just not even fair. I, I may take 15. I hope that's all right. Okay, so we're going to start with decision trees. Decision trees. Um, we have a pile of data and we want to cut them up into bins. And we have various metrics that we've measured them on. In this case, I have uh, some value for metric A, some value for metric B, and some value for metric C, okay? So let's imagine that we have a box at the start that contains all of the, all of the input data. So at this point, we would compute something called a Gini impurity uh, for that box and it detects that we have just as many cases as we have controls here, right? So we have orange and blue boxes, the, the, what maybe the uh, oranges are cases and the blues are controls. So we see that this is a very impure relationship. So we could ask our data set, which one metric can I use to best separate cases from controls, to, to cut my impurity down a lot? So in this case, the software comes back to say, well, out of the A, B, and C measurements, we're going to use the measurement for A to make that decision, and we're going to set a threshold on it of five. So now we see that the data have been shuffled apart. These are the points that have uh, A values less than five. These are the ones that have values greater than five. And we can see that the impurity has changed just a little bit. No one metric was particularly good for teasing those apart. But the impurity values did fall. You can see that this box has more blues than oranges. This box has more oranges than blues. Now, within this collection, I can ask the software which one metric is most useful for separating blues from oranges. And you can see that, the applying, uh, that applying one more rule to ask whether the B metric is less than 7 or not is pretty good. You can see that these are all blues except for one orange, and these are all oranges with one blue. So that's brilliant. Now we've, we've applied just two rules, and we've already got a pretty good level of purity that comes out here. Now over here, we have a different, we ask the software, which rule can I use to separate the blues from oranges best? 
it decides the rule that the metric C can be compared to cut them into these two sections. And we see that we got a perfect impurity here um, and not so perfect here. We had one orange mixed in with all the blues. So that's the point of a decision tree. Use one metric at a time to reduce the impurity of a heterogeneous collection and try to make it more and more homogeneous. You see that? Okay, so this is uh, the, the sometimes called CART classification and regression trees. So if you see decision trees or CART, th this uh, slide explains that part. Very frequently, we will see that people use something related to decision trees called a random forest as their method for machine learning. And a random forest is an ensemble learner, which is to say that rather than using one rule for deciding uh, what, uh, what class a particular sample falls into, it will use a whole collection of weak learners to do this. So in the, in the prior slide, I showed you a two-stage decision tree, right? It had one rule to cut into the left or the right fork, and then uh, a second stage to cut those into uh, that. Typically, you will see that, uh, that random forests will use, very, uh, will, not, will use very shallow trees like that, to have a very small number of uh, rules for, for segregating into these groups. But there are lots and, <coughs> lots and lots of these trees built. Typically, we'll see that instead of creating one decision tree from all of the data, it will generate many decision trees by using different samples drawn from the larger data set. So instead of uh, creating one decision tree to explain the rule, uh, to, to set the rule for all of the samples, we will generate a decision tree from this 20% of the data set or that 20% of the data set, and that will give us a different tree each time. Then, when we try to evaluate which class a, a new sample should fit into, it's, compared, it's tested on all of those trees. And you can do something like a big vote for it. This tree says that's a case. This tree says it's a case. This tree says it's a control. This tree says it's a case, 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 control. The vote says it's a case. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my throat is giving up. Okay, so random forests tend to be a relatively robust way to avoid making misjudgments. They tend to be uh, a really nice way to capture the variability of the data set in a way that allows you to make a decision um, relatively securely. In a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the examinations that people have used to evaluate different machine learning data sets, uh, machine learning strategies in different data sets, random forests have performed very, very well. So you'll quite frequently see that this approach has been used uh, very broadly. Okay, I think many people, at least uh, at the time I was in grad school, think of, of machine learning as synonymous with artificial neural networks. But a lot of people find artificial neural networks very, very difficult to understand. You will occasionally see nonsense journalism that, uh, that says artificial neural networks cause the computer to emulate the behavior of biological brains. That is a, a pretty awful uh, analogy, if you ask me. It's not actually informative in any way of how these things work. So I would direct your attention to the top left of the, of the slide there, the model neuron. The neurons in our brains are axons and dendrites interacting in, in, in these, these very complex ways. It's quite different from what a, a model neuron behaves like in this context. So let us imagine that uh, this neuron has three different uh, parameters associated with it. One is how much weight is it going to put on feature one. Uh, Another, uh, another factor that it has available to it is the weight that it's going to place on feature two. And then a third uh, uh, configuration aspect to it is that it's going to have a bias. How much more does it prefer giving result one than result two? Out of that comes an, an, an output. So this is uh, a very simple structure here where the software is figuring out how it combines information from different features and comes up with a decision at the end that gets output to another neuron. So here we're looking at a single neuron in abstraction from others. 
But we see that in, in most of the structures that we create uh, for artificial neural networks, we have many neurons that are interacting with each other. Perhaps this neuron pays a lot of attention to inputs two and three, but it has next to no input from feature number one, right? So we see that this, this first layer is receiving information from the features that are exposed to it. They're combining those inputs in a variety of ways, which then produce an output. That output is then received by another layer of neurons that are deciding how to combine that in some sort of random way. That information gets output to an output layer, which combines that layer to produce some output value. <clears throat> that might seem like so much nonsense, right? But one of the very powerful things that we can do is that even if you start with relatively random weighting of which values these, these neurons are paying attention to and how they weight them individually, we find that we can use a strategy like backpropagation to, uh, to teach these models which inputs they should pay attention to, which ones they should ignore, how they should uh, combine information. So backpropagation updates the hidden layers after each example is given to it to favor the weights that minimize the error in supervised learning. That might seem really confusing, so let's, let's try thinking about it. Imagine that my training set consists of 200 individuals. Maybe they're split more or less evenly between cases and controls. So I feed it the first example. This is a case. The model reports back it's a, contr it's a, a control instead. So we can inform the model, okay, what you, what you just told me is wrong. You came to the wrong judgment about this person. Uh, and so the, the, the software may try to adjust the parameters that led to getting this wrong classification. Then you feed it the second person. Again, it's going to either get it right or it's going to get it wrong. And if it gets it right, it's going to reinforce the, uh, the, the, the pathways that led to that being a correct association. If it gets it wrong, it's going to penalize it. So by the time you fed it 200 examples from your training set, the software has gotten better and better at making the right judgment because you've been uh, using this, this, uh, this back propagation to to give it a kick when it gives you the wrong answer and give it a, a nice stroke uh, when it gives you the right. So that is an example of back propagation. More recently, we've seen a lot of people making use of deep feed-forward networks, and this is a really odd thing. This is a, a, a headline that popped out of this. Google's artificial brain learns to find cat videos. Yes, Google created a, a deep feed-forward network that could sniff through all of YouTube. And having done that, it found that there were certain patterns that, re that resulted in this very large collection of, of uh, video material. That there's a pattern associated with things like whiskers and pointed ears and, and fuzz, you know? So their, their application of machine learning on the YouTube oeuvre recognized cat videos, in effect. So this is the kind of thing that you can do with artificial neural networks and uh, and yet, these are not so dominant in the space of clinical biomarkers. We typically see that this is uh, getting used in a, in, a, in a rather different way, uh, in, in the way like deep feed forward networks are used. And you see less of this uh, being used as a way to produce signatures of disease. Okay, the final example I want to talk about is support vector machines. Uh, support vector machines can be pretty complex to work with. So. Uh, I would start by saying that we want to create a great plane in space. So if you imagine this table surface as, as our hyperplane in this case, I want to draw a line through my data in multi-dimensional space that puts all the cases on one side and all the controls on the other. Everyone sees that, right? But the thing is we've measured these data in thousands of dimensions, thousands of different transcripts we've measured. So how do we create a, a, a space that's shaped right so that all the cases end up on one side and all the controls end up on the other. It's very difficult. So, uh, typically, we will see something called a kernel function. Um, now, before we talked about Euclidean distances in the context of, uh, of clustering to say how far apart are these samples, a kernel function may use that kind of linear space to create these, these Euclidean distances between points, 
But more generally, it'll, it is allowed to combine the information of the different dimensions quite a lot more flexibly than does the Euclidean space. So you could imagine uh, a case where you have data that look like these. <coughs> imagine that we've measured only two uh, values for each point, uh, for each sample. We've, we've measured it on the x-axis, we've measured it on the y-axis, zero is the center of the distribution for both of these measurements. But we see that all of our cases are in the middle and all of the controls are on the outside, or vice versa. How can you draw a line across this space that separates all of the positives from all the negatives, all the controls from the cases? It's not possible, is it? So if we are able to distort the relationship between x and y in this case, to create a, uh, a function that uh, elevates points that are close to the middle and pulls back elements that are out to the edges, we can make a much better separation. You can see that if we distort the plane of those two measurements, we can create a, a plane across that space that perfectly separates all of the cases from all of the controls. So it's, it's this kind of... Um, redimensionalization uh, that, that is feasible through the, the application of these kernel functions that allows us to create a new set of dimensions based on the original measurements that allow us to separate the values in this way. Support vector machines are quite popular in, this, in the space where I work in, in proteomics uh, as a way to do things like say which spectra have been correctly identified, which spectra have not. Uh, so if you're doing protein identification it may be that the software you're using is behind the scenes performing machine learning to separate the good IDs from the bad. Uh, this method is also applicable, of course, in the space of clinical biomarkers. So you can see that those are three really different approaches for trying to decide which features we want to pay attention to in creating a decision rule. We talked about decision trees and their relationships with random forests. We talked about artificial neural networks as an approach to um, <clears throat> to figure out which bits of the information we're going to pay attention to and how will we weight it. And then in this case, we looked at a, a way of, uh, of creating a new dimensional space for putting all of these uh, patients into in order for us to make a decision that separates the, the cases from the controls. All right, now that was a lot of content and I really appreciate your willingness to, to, to sit through that. I know that Machine learning has, has been treated as a black box by a lot of people, and studies that use machine learning have been thought inherently better than those that use more statistical methods, really, uh, for deciding which values uh, are positives and which are negatives. But I hope that you've learned enough today to know that there are a lot of ways you can fool yourself <coughs> by using machine learning. A lot of papers make it into press today where people didn't know as much as they sh should have about the models that they used to manipulate their data. So we have to be really careful as we read the literature to evaluate whether people followed the commandments or not in trying to figure out how to apply machine learning to their data sets. Okay, so if you're using labels as part of, of training your model, you're using supervised learning rather than unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is also very valuable Generally speaking, if you're trying to create a decision rule to separate cases from controls, you're using supervised machine learning. Many predictive models could be produced from a given training set. The best models excel in a never-before-seen test set, not in a reused validation set. I, that point can't be stressed strongly enough. So we should always be cognizant when we're reading papers to ask whether the final test of the model was used in a, in a, in a data set to which that model was naive. It, it, it's a very important thing that the models be evaluated only in, in, for publication on data they haven't seen before.